Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for July 24th, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to talk about what we've been up to at the water cooler. This is Slash Film Editor in Chief Peter Serretta. And joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. A weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? So HT is away on vacation. She has a, a vacation with her whole family. She's like around. She's like on a beach with like forty other buoys. So uh, she's not here with us. And Chris is having technical problems, so he's also not joining us. So we have a half full water cooler episode today. Uh, but we we have a bunch of stuff to talk about. Let's start with what we've been doing. Jacob, uh, you went to San Diego one day early. What what, what did you do? Yeah, this is my new tradition. I'm flying into San Diego for Comic-Con 24 hours early to see the city, see the sights. And last year I saw the San Diego Zoo, and this year I did the Balboa Park, which is just this massive sprawl of things to do uh, right on the edge of downtown San Diego. It's beautiful landscapes, museums, architecture. It was built for a World's Fair, and all the buildings were kept up and maintained, and they all now contain many things to do. Uh, so I start off going to the San Diego Natural History Museum, which is fine. It is a nice place, especially if you're, I think it feels more family oriented than lots of other museums are. Like I think kids would dig it way much more than I did. Uh, but from there, I started walking the grounds, uh, on my Twitter feed and my Instagram, you can see a lot of pictures or we should just Google it cause it's beautiful. And I went to the, let's see, what was it called? The uh, San Diego History Center, which was... Just this very uh, small, seemingly plain, you know, local history museum. Uh, but in San Diego, they had exhibits dedicated to um, the punk rock movement of the 80s, like skateboard art and <laughs> entire section uh, celebrating the LGBTQ uh, citizens of San Diego. And I went to uh, art mu- the art museum. I walked past the Museum of Man, which is this very gorgeous anthropology museum. I was running out of time and I was getting tired. Uh, but the Balboa Park, it's the kind of place where it makes you wish every city had a dedicated cultural center where there's literally something for everyone to see and do, whether it be educational or just relaxing, relaxing or eating or just, you know, enjoying the, being outdoors in nice weather. Have any of you guys done Balboa Park during your trips to San Diego? I have not, but I'm wondering what, what was the coolest thing you saw in Balboa Park? Oh, goodness. Um, honestly... Uh, if I had to pick one thing that like really stands out now, it would be the botanical gardens because the so many botanical gardens these days are extremely high tech and built into the land. And this one was built for initially for the World's Fair, so it has an extremely old school look to the building. When you're in there, it really feels like you're in a piece of history, and there's this massive reflecting pond in front of it, and it just it looks like you've walked into a, you know an architectural choice from 1919, and I it's a beautiful beautiful building. I've never been to Balboa Park, but I, when I lived in uh, San Francisco, I lived right above Golden Gate Park, and it sounds like it's kind of the same thing. I, I don't think Golden Gate Park was built for the World Fair, but it has uh, you know museums, it has botanical gardens, it it has a ton of stuff. You can see bison, like live bison, in Golden Gate Park, and I, I used to love walking through it. And I, I lived like right across the street from it uh, when I lived in San Francisco for three years, and I used to walk through it all the time and I would discover new things every single time. So, uh, if, so Jacob, if you ever go to San Francisco, check out Golden Gate Park. Uh, I, next time I'm there, I shall. When the last time I was in San Francisco, my main priority was hiking to Zodiac Killer uh, locations and taking pictures with them. <laughs> <laughs> what, what else have you been up to? Uh, I survived Comic-Con, uh, as we all did. You, you, uh, hopefully uh, you listened to our dispatches from uh, from the location and you get to hear everything we did. But Comic-Con this year was um, quieter than usual. But Peter, I think you'd agree with me that it was a good year. Like I, I feel like we were never like overworked. We had a good hotel. We, it, it was a solid, like compared to last year where I was run ragged, I think we handled it pretty well, right? Yeah, it was, um, I, I think it's because there wasn't like insane stuff going on everywhere that we were able to just have such a, uh, I don't know. I don't want to sound like we're patting ourselves on the back, but we, I, I really am proud of our coverage this year. Um, we, we really were able to c- cover all the, the major stuff in a good way. 
Um, and it was like not insane. Like I didn't feel like usually I, there's like a point in the convention where I'm like running from one side of the convention hall to the other and like I'm sweating and just not happy. And I feel like I was happy this entire time at the, the con this year. Yeah, true. And uh, I did do a little bit of shopping on my last day and I bought a, an IF Agamotto from Doctor Strange replica uh, necklace. It was very cool. Has a good weight to it. No reason to exist. I, but you know what? I, I had to get it. And if you're wondering if this will get you uh, questioned by a TSA agent as you try to get it through airport security, the answer is yes. So uh, all apologies to TSA agent who had to uh, interrogate me about the odd object in my bag that was a Marvel Studios replica. Uh, so that, that happened. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, um, I exercised every day at Comic-Con, which was, um, which was something I thought I couldn't pull off, but I did. And... Since my last time of my exercise routine, I've doubled my cardio, and I've started working in resistance bands into my daily workout as well, in addition to regular weights. And I recommend them. They're extremely portable. If you're traveling, you can bring them with you. And if you I mean, they don't give the initial satisfaction of free weights, but they, you, know, you do them the right way, you do the right form, and they're making a difference. So, yeah, um, Comic-Con did not derail the regimen to become a fitter person this year. And that's been my week so far. See, I should have followed your lead, Jacob. I, I gained a good 10 pounds on my Comic-Con uh, trip slash uh, a couple days before I was also off my diet. So uh, I was, Peter, <laughs> Peter, that's all water weight. I'm like, like, I have not weighed myself at all since I got back. I've been, I, you know, I've purely been going by, you know, my various test shirts and gold pants and whatnot, and nothing changed. I think I even made a little bit of progress. Uh, so I, I honestly don't think you gained a substantial weight. You just have a bunch of crap floating your system that'll be gone within a couple days you gain back in your diet you'll be fine i hope you're right okay uh what have i been up to right before i went to comic-con i went to the alamo draft house downtown los angeles to get a sneak preview tour this is the it, it soft opened on friday while we were at comic-con and this is the first alamo draft house in in los angeles it's the i think second in california there was one in uh northern california somewhere um and this is, uh, you know, I when I first went to the Alamo Draft House and your neck of the woods, Jacob, uh, like probably 13 years ago for Fantastic Fest or South by, I was amazed at how great a movie theater could be. Like this is a movie theater for film fanatics. This is a movie theater for people who just love movies and food and everything. Uh, and I, you know, I would talk to Tim League, the owner of the Alamo Draft House, every time I would come into to town. For some event, I'd be like, when are you going to bring the Alamo to L.A.? And he always had these plans. And, yeah, I think even like eight or nine years ago, he was like, we found a location. And that fell through. And uh, But now it is finally open. They built it from scratch. It's in this development called The Block, um, which is like this open-air mall in downtown Los Angeles. Um, this is one of the four Alamo draft houses that has a video vortex. And what that is is a, like event space slash bar slash um, video store. It's like a new age video store. They basically have bought up all the DVDs and Blu-rays from when uh, big uh, video stores go under. And they have 40,000 titles in this video vortex. Uh, they don't have VHS like they have in Raleigh, North Carolina, but they have everything else. Um, and if you live in Los Angeles, you can go there and rent up to two movies a week for free, which is insane. If I lived anywhere near downtown LA, I, I might do that because there's lots of titles there that aren't available on streaming or probably even on Netflix, uh, you know, disc uh, mailing service. Um, and uh, I don't know, the space looks so cool. They have a space for, they're going to be doing tabletop gaming events. The the bar, the bar menus printed on this like VHS clamshells. The, uh, they have a wall of Mondo posters that are all like, Mondo posters that have been sold out for, you know, recently up towards to like a few years and you can actually buy them. It is a little bit more. It's like, I think it's like $225. It comes with the frame. Uh, and then the, the theaters themselves, there's like a uh, dozen or so screens and uh, they are a little bit smaller. They're not like the grand screens that like I'm used to in like these, uh, like the Arclight or the AMC. But, uh, you know, one of them has 35 millimeter projection. All of them have Barco laser projection and all of them have that, uh, you know, 
during the movie food service and the pre movie, you know, uh, what do you call that, uh, Jacob? They, they like show like a package of clips. Oh, yeah, this is the Alvin Gratis pre show. It's all it is. Yeah, but it's it's fun. It's uh, weird and wacky and and insane. It's the movie you're going to see. So if you if you see a movie about karate, they'll have like old school karate videos. If you see a movie about Spider Man, they'll have Spider Man toy commercials and clips from animated shows. It's, it's it, they do a really good job curating those pre shows. Yeah, and the hallways are filled with these oversized posters. I did a whole write up for this last week. I'll link it in the show notes. So if you want to check out uh, and learn more information about the Alamo Draft House downtown Los Angeles location. Uh, you can check that out there. And um, before I went to Comic-Con, I went to Disneyland again because I'm there almost every week. And I uh, was... By the way, at, at Comic-Con, I I want to say how wonderful it was to run into a lot of uh, readers of the site, listeners of this podcast that... Uh, would show me on their phone, you know, that it was in their podcast feed. Um, but I was surprised that I was running into so many people that have been watching uh, my new YouTube channel, Ordinary Adventures. Like, I would probably say it was by far, like, probably two, probably, like, double the people that knew me from the site, knew me from this YouTube channel and would come up to me on the show floor. I know HT got stopped at one point because she was talking and someone overheard her voice and recognized her voice from the podcast. Um, but uh, it was wonderful meeting everybody. And uh, I was saying I was at Disneyland. Uh, we were at Galaxy's Edge again, of course. And uh, we were filming videos, which will be coming up sometime soon. But uh, we were in line. Uh, it, by the way, it, when we're at Disneyland, we got stopped by a ton of people that watch this YouTube channel. It's, it's insane. And uh, when we were in line for the Smuggler's Run ride, the, the ride where you get to ride the Millennium Falcon, uh, there was a young kid who came over and wanted to get a photo with me and Kitra. And uh, we, we only had four people with us. And we were hoping on this trip to try another experiment on this ride and see if we could crash the Millennium Falcon. And uh, we, we asked uh, this kid and his mom if they would be willing to be part of our crew, and they, they were. So we shot this video. I put it up today, and it's us basically trying to get the lowest score possible on this ride. And it's a, it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, of course, you can't crash it. Uh, so spoiler alert, you know, it's not – you can't have a bad experience on this ride. But it's uh, – I'm, I'm going to put the link in the show notes for you to watch there. And uh, – yeah, that's what I've been up to. Brad, what have you been doing? Well, this was the first year in nine years that I didn't go to Comic-Con. Um, <clears throat> kind of a combination of just the, the timing of when Comic-Con was happening and when my girlfriend was coming out here, which kind of fluctuated a little bit. It just made it easier to not go this year, especially because uh, this year ended up being a much lighter year as far as uh, movie coverage and not being a lot of things, you know, like you guys said, you guys weren't super busy on the ground. So we weren't, uh, quite as busy, uh, in general. So I was able to stay back and just work remotely and help cover it with Chris and Ben from our, uh, respective homes. And it made it a lot easier for me to get stuff done around the house here because my girlfriend is finally moving in with me later this week. Right now she's currently driving, uh, across the country from Utah to move here. And so I've been trying to get the house in order and move stuff around and kind of shift my belongings so there's room for her stuff and just uh, get things cleaned up since uh, her sister and sister's husband are going to be staying here for a few days because they're driving uh, across the country with her. And yeah, it, it's honestly, I like going to Comic-Con. It can be stressful, but I didn't miss it as much as I thought I would. There were some things that I saw and, uh, heard about and things that I was like, oh man, that would be cool to go to or see or uh, something like that. But I really didn't miss out on much. I felt like this year, if I was, if I was going to miss a year at Comic-Con, I think it worked out well that it was this one. No, I, I, I think that's probably fair. And uh, Brad, we didn't need you. We didn't need you at all. Whoa, rude. No, I want, I want to thank you, Ben, Chris, everybody for, keeping things running at home because we couldn't have done it without you guys and you guys also and during the marvel panel which was insane you guys helped out quite a bit so um yeah thank you uh okay let's move on to what we've been reading jacob with all this traveling what have you been reading 
Yeah, I read uh, Adam McKinthy's The Chain in two sittings, uh, half on the flight to San Diego and the other half on the way back. And this was one hell of a read. It's a book that pretty much all the authors that follow on Twitter have been talking about nonstop for months now. So I picked it up for this trip specifically, and I was bowled over by it. It's the best, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, beach read I've had since Gone Girl. It is an incredibly exciting, very chilling thriller about a uh, young single mother who is driving to work and gets a phone call uh, and telling her that her 13-year-old daughter has been kidnapped and that she's now she's now joined the chain and she must deposit $25,000 in Bitcoin to a mysterious account and then abduct another child in order to get her kid back and keep the chain going. And the book is this descent into hell as a mother has to pretty much enact another parent's worst nightmare in order to solve her own worst nightmare. And it goes to very dark places, and I found the whole thing incredibly upsetting and incredibly exciting. It's one of those thrillers where it leans very heavily in the horror territory at times, and I was extremely riveted by it. Chris, you need to put this on your to-read list. I think you would devour this in, like, two hours. It, it, oh, wait, Chris is here? I am here. How did that happen? You, uh, joined, you joined us about five minutes ago. Oh, I'm crazy. always here. I just stay on when everyone leaves, and I wait for you guys to come back. <laughs> have you have you heard of this book, Chris? <laughs> yes, I have heard of this book. I haven't read it yet, but I, I've definitely heard of it. I mean, the concept yeah. of this book sounds fascinating. It, it sounds like it could make for a good movie. Yeah, I know Paramount has the film rights, and I've already uh, I've already cast Allison Brie and David Harbour as the two leads, so I, I'll take the check, Paramount. Um, yeah, it, it, I think with a David Fincher type director, this could be like a Gone Girl level like success i really think that this could be the the thing people get really excited about okay so the chain check that out uh let's move on to what we've been watching and and now that chris is here uh the first thing up we were going to talk about is once upon a time in hollywood the new quentin tarantino movie i'm gonna throw it to chris because i think he was the most excited person to see this in our crew uh yes i uh i loved this movie it's um (laughs) You know, I'm a Tarantino fan, so I don't know. Maybe I'm biased going into this, but I I loved pretty much every minute of this movie. It's definitely long, and I could definitely see why some people would think it's it's too long because there are very long. Um, I don't know what to call them, like sort of like vignettes where he literally stops the movie to focus on like. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, who's an actor, acting out like entire scenes, and I could see some people getting like <laughs> bored with that, or, or be like, "Oh, why is this happening?" But it, it really worked for me. And on top of all that, like I was taken aback at how surprisingly sweet this movie is. Like Tarantino doesn't really do sweetness; he doesn't really do that. You know, he you know he makes funny movies, but they're you know they always have this like tinge of darkness to them and this reminded me a lot of jackie brown which is one of my favorite of his movies because that's a very melancholy movie that has sort of like a good heart to it that his other movies do not and this has that too but it also blends that like weird goofy over the topness of like inglorious bastards so it's sort of like a combo between jackie brown and inglorious bastards which are my two favorite tarantino movies so this to me was like uh, heaven, just you know, him mashing up those two kind of styles to make this really unique film. You know, it's funny, but it's also sad, and uh, it, it sort of descends into this really graphically violent ending. That you know, even though Tarantino always does violence, it 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 even shocked me at how how brutal the, the like the last like twenty or so minutes of this movie gets, and, and he does it in this really weird way where it, it's. It keeps going back and forth between being like disturbing and funny. Like it's a really weird balance. I don't even know how he pulls it off. Like I have to see it again to study this scene in particularly because you know without giving anything away, it goes from being like oh my god, this is so disturbingly brutal to being oh this is actually very funny, and then it goes back to being brutal again. I I, it's I was. was very impressed with it just overall and uh you know i I don't you know i'm not gonna rank it as far as you know his other movies go but uh, right now it's definitely near the top for me like i i feel like i have to sit through it one more time to really digest it but 
as of now, it's near the top of like my favorite of things he's done. I, I, I saw it last night with Ben. I really enjoyed it. I think I liked it at least better than his last couple films. Um, it is interesting how like this movie and I know I know Tarantino often has an unusual style and structure to his films. But like this film doesn't seem to go by any of like the traditional screenplay structure at all. Like it's jumping between these, these characters and these stories. And it's, you almost, if if you don't know what happens in, you know, to some of these characters in real life, like you don't even know where it's headed, if that makes sense. Um, And, uh, but I really enjoyed it. I do feel like it is a little bit indulgent. Like you were, saying chris i know that you enjoyed that i I kind of enjoyed it too um it does go on like these asides of like if i if this was a studio movie which i guess it is but i feel like there could you could cut out like 50 minutes from this film and you wouldn't lose anything story-wise or character-wise um but i am enjoying myself so much in those 50 minutes that i don't think it's a criticism um, I just love the old school Hollywood throwback, uh, living in this world through the eyes of Tarantino. And um, I'm not sure what Quinn is trying to say with the end of this film. Um, as much as I have kind of get what he's trying to do with a lot of his other films. And I'd like to have a discussion with you guys at a later point about that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. I, I will say... That Tarantino's obsession with uh, women's feet is getting very distracting. Like, there's multiple times throughout this film that, like, a woman's naked foot is, like, in the middle of the frame in a close-up. I don't know. That really doesn't bother me. I feel like, you know, what, you know every director <laughs> has their own uh, thing they, they love to highlight. And, you know... Sure, that's that's abnormal, I guess. But I also feel like that argument has gotten so old at this point where it's like, oh, he likes feet. It's like, all right, we get it. Like, just <laughs> I, I don't I really it, it, but, I mean, never... it's the equivalent of like, like if a director put like breasts front and center, like a few times throughout a movie, like I would I would make that same argument. It's not that no, it's, here, here it's, it's not is, because here, it's, it's weird because it's feet. It's because it's like so prominently displayed. No, here's the thing, Peter. It's as if John Woo released doves like like six or seven times in a movie instead of just, you know, <laughs> once or twice or something. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, what did you think of this film? Uh, I really, really liked it a lot. It's easily one of my favorite movies of the year. I think I, I don't quite uh, I wasn't like as instantly in love with it and thought that it was like an all time classic in this in the way that I thought about Inglorious Bastards when I walked out of that movie. Um and I, I still need to like rewatch uh, Hateful Eight because I think I've only seen that once um, during its theatrical run, and I, I remember really liking that one a lot. So you know, in terms of like rankings and stuff, I'm not exactly sure where this would fall, but uh, I really, really liked it a lot. I, I also think that it's like a little bit long, um, but you know, it, it's sort of tough to complain when even the indulgent parts are so good. And this is very much like a hangout movie. It's very much like a uh, you know, a film where you just luxuriate in the world that, that he's created or, or recreated in a lot of cases. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's it's so fun to, like, watch these characters and, and see, you know, huge movie stars play roles like this that, that feel um, like they're up to, that feel like they're the type of roles that those actors should be playing all the time, if that makes any sense. Like, a lot of times I feel like, Brad Pitt in particular is like underutilized as an actor. And this just the role that he plays here is it gives him a lot to do and a lot to chew on. And um, it it sort of like capitalizes on his A-list movie star persona in such a great way. Um, There is one thing actually about his character, a a reveal that comes that uh, we'll talk about later on, because I'm curious what you guys think about about that. But uh yeah, just overall, I, I really liked this a lot. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, there's some stuff in here that, like, Tarantino is just, like, working on a whole nother level. There's these, like, POV shots where these characters are in cars just, like, speeding through the Hollywood Hills, like, at breakneck 
paces that seem so dangerous and it's just like as if they're speeding toward oblivion you know this is like a it's him like exploring this time period like the end of an era and the, the beginning of a new one that's just about to come and like the end of innocence in a lot of ways with the Sharon Tate stuff and um these characters are just like you know blazing forward because they don't know what's ahead of them and um yeah I, I found a lot to love about this movie yeah, so I think we we all agree. Go see this film. Uh, it hits theaters what tomorrow, Friday, something like that. Well, te- you know, tomorrow night, but yeah, you know, Friday is the the official. Yeah, so order. Thursday night or fr- you know Thursday late night or Friday. Um, okay, uh, you know I think uh, probably about six months ago I saw this documentary on the Amazing Jonathan. The Amazing Jonathan is this magician. He's a comedy magician. He's someone I grew up watching, and I would go to Boston and see his show. Uh, he used to have specials on Comedy Central. He uh, It's this uh, over-the-top guy who didn't really do magic as much as comedy, but uh, I, I just loved his style and his humor, and uh, he lived this larger-than-life life where uh, he was always practical, joke like pulling jokes on people and uh it was always like he had this infamous uh persona in 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 the magic world and six months ago i saw this documentary called always amazing uh that chronicled well what happened with jonathan is uh he a few years back got diagnosed with some kind of like cancer of some kind that was basically told that he would be lucky to have a year left in his life. And uh, to give you an idea, he, he announced this at like some uh, big event on a stage. And when he announced it, people in the audience laughed because they thought he was joking. Um, and uh, they, they made this documentary about him always amazing uh, which I saw at a sneak preview screening. I thought this was the documentary that was playing at Sundance, but it wasn't because apparently after Jonathan announced this news, it was not one, not two, but m- like m- more than more than two. I'm going to say more than two documentaries have been made about Amazing Jonathan in the wake of this news. And this documentary I saw um, over the last week was called is called The Amazing Jonathan Documentary. And this is coming to Hulu. And this is interesting. The, the other documentary, Always Amazing, kind of focuses on Jonathan and this guy that he becomes his assistant at, at a young age and their relationship. And it's this really uh, thoughtful uh, relationship story uh, uh, told, uh, you know, as a documentary. And this documentary, The Amazing Jonathan, was kind of trying to show the the more real the more like uh, jonathan has been abusing drugs for many years and it we get to see that on screen and it's uh not sugar-coated in any way and uh t- during this documentary the filmmaker learns that he's not the only one making a documentary about amazing jonathan that there is not only one other person uh the person who made uh uh, s- some big Academy Award winning films was apparently making a documentary about Amazing Jonathan, but there's other people out there. So it now becomes a story where the filmmaker becomes a character in the story and he's trying to figure out how how do you make this documentary while there's other filmmakers following, you know, there's other camera crews following him. There's other, it, it becomes almost about the, the, insanity that surrounds Jonathan and also the how to make like how do you deal with making a documentary in these kind of circumstances which I'm sure comes up more often than you think um, and I think that's interesting I think uh, I like this documentary it's gonna be on Hulu I think sometime in August and I would I would recommend it I, I, I do think it's disappointing that neither of the amazing Jonathan documentaries we've gotten thus far are really about amazing Jonathan do you know what I mean? Like, uh, they both, uh, I think because everybody knew there were, there was multiple documentaries in the works. They, they all kind of tr- tried to take a different, interesting angle. And because of that, we're not actually getting the documentary about him. We're getting a documentary about, uh, aspects of him. And, uh, but, uh, check it out when it, when it hits Hulu, uh, sometime in August. I, uh, you know, I remember mentioning, I saw Barry season two. I watched the first couple episodes and I was, not as hot on it as you guys were. 
And uh, I thought it was kind of a downgrade from season one. I loved season one of Barry on HBO. And you guys have been talking about it ever since on the water cooler. And I was like, you know what? We'll put it back on. We'll give it another shot. And I I watched a few more episodes. And uh, you guys were right. I was wrong. Uh, this, This season has taken it up. A few notches. Uh, there's particularly one episode that I just watched, which uh, I'm not going to spoil much, but Barry goes on a mission and involves him and a little kid, which is just so fantastic. Uh, this is one of my favorite shows on television right now. Uh, you can watch this on HBO. That's Barry season two. And I also saw Midsommar. Uh, you guys have talked at length about this. I like this movie quite a bit. It's probably on, up there on my top of the, of the year list at this point and um i don't think i have too much to add to the conversation you guys did a whole spoiler episode so i i think um you know i i guess the only criticism i will give it is i kind of like what they were doing in the beginning of this film with uh it it kind of focused on like the gaslighting uh, in this relationship and i feel like that wasn't followed up on too much in the later part of this movie in the way I wish it was. Maybe that's my expectations of what I wanted, but uh, I really enjoyed this movie. Um, and that's in theaters right now. Okay. Uh, Jacob, what have you been watching? Uh, the only things I saw were at Comic-Con and I touched on them on those Comic-Con episodes, but I want to touch on them again really briefly because I'm still excited about them. And those are the first two episodes of the Amazon series Undone uh, by the uh, BoJack Horseman creator Raphael Bob Waxberg and uh, Kate Purdy, one of the writers on BoJack. And this show, I am s- no release date yet, but the first two episodes are really phenomenal. And you need to watch the first two together to really understand what the show is about. But it's beautiful rotoscope animation, a really challenging and beautiful concept. And it promises to be something really unique. And I'm looking forward to talking about this more in the future. And this is the one I'm going to recommend to Chris. Chris, I think you're going to like Undone. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to recommend The Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance to Ben. Because, Ben, I have no love for Dark Crystal. That original movie did not leave an impression on me whatsoever. But Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance feels so much like puppet Game of Thrones that I think you're going to be into it in a big way. There's... Dozens of plot lines, like 30 main characters, tons of terminology and, and lore to learn. And by the end of the first episode, I was ready to like start looking at maps to understand this world. So, uh, <laughs> Chris, you watch Undone. Ben, you watch Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. We'll all be good. Nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brad, what have you been watching? Uh, I realized actually, I actually haven't been watching much. And part of it, I think, is just because of... Uh, being caught up with Comic Con stuff. The other part has just been mostly because I've been busy getting the house uh, stuff prepared here at the house. But I did realize after the Emmy nominations came out recently that uh, I never actually finished The Good Place season three. I for some reason had thought that I did, but then when I was thinking about it, I was I couldn't remember how season three ended. And sure enough, I went back to my DVR and I had three episodes left on The Good Place. Uh, and that was that was actually just a nice summer surprise treat because I sat down and breezed right through them, uh, and the 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 ending of this show is so good and like it makes me so excited for season four which has been announced to to be the last, and I'm extremely excited to see how they uh, start to wrap this story up. Um, it's it's really been great. I love that they're ending it on their own terms. I'm glad it's not going to go too long and where it'll be. Uh, tired. I'm glad that NBC is, hasn't canceled it or anything. So, yeah, after finishing season three properly, I'm uh, very excited to see what the final season has in store. Cool. And you've been watching other stuff? Uh, yeah. So in my, uh, in going back through my DVR, I sort of decided to finally start watching the final season of Broad City. Uh, it's a show that I've really liked on Comedy Central when it, when it was on, but I uh, never sat down to watch the final season. So the all of the episodes have just been sitting there, and so I finally started working through that. And uh, I, as I've been watching, I, I think I got through three episodes. Uh, it just it made me realize how much I'm going to miss it. Um, Abby and Alana on that show are absolutely fantastic. They're such a great duo. I, I would love to see them do more together, whether it's a, a different series or uh, a movie or something like that. 
Um, but they're just they're both fantastic as, as writers and as uh, a comedy duo on screen. And yeah, w- once I finish this this final season, I'll, I will be sad to see it go. Oh, uh, one last thing I want to mention. Um, I got this email over when I was at Comic Con. Uh, you know, I mentioned how I've been watching Masterclass, and I got this email of like, "Good news, Peter! We've added 20 minutes of new footage to the Penn and Teller Masterclass." And as you know, I love Penn and Teller and I love the Masterclass. So I, I head on over to Masterclass to watch the 20 minutes of new footage to learn that the 20 minutes of new footage has just been randomly inserted into all the lessons and that there's no detailed uh, account of wh- where you can find the new footage or whatever. Uh, Chris, I know you've been a Masterclass subscriber for a while. Is, is, is this something they do, that they do regularly? Uh, I've never noticed that, honestly, myself, so I don't think so. Maybe it's just like a – maybe this is a magic trick itself, Peter. Have you thought of that? (laughs) They're trying to get me to watch it again is what they're doing. That's the the real trick to get you to keep watching. (laughs) Yeah, I I thought they were going to add like new lessons or something. I was so weirded out by this. Anyways, um, Ben, what have you been watching? Uh, my wife and I watched Lilo and Stitch for the first time, and this movie came out in 2002, and it was sort of in that like uh, post Mulan Tarzan uh, phase of Disney animation where I sort of missed several of their movies, and uh, I know that this one, like this and like uh, the Emperor's New Groove, I think are one of the are like the were the two biggest ones that. People of our generation, uh, maybe like a few years younger than me as well, seem to really love these movies. So my wife and I were both sort of like curious about, um, you know, whether we would react in the same way to these films as as these, uh, you know, our our contemporaries, I guess. And um, I don't know, I think I, I guess I can speak for her, but I think both of us just sort of found it like, oh, yeah, this is a fine movie, but uh, it wasn't really anything to write home about, I think. The animation style is interesting. They they chose to do uh, watercolor backgrounds for a lot of this stuff, and it, it definitely feels like it uh, like um, I guess just notably different than a lot of the Disney animation stuff. But for me, it's sort of even though it's set in Hawaii and the the watercolor stuff is supposed to you know be like this evocative um, uh, way to create this Hawaiian world, it the whole movie just had this feeling of like wow, this feels a little cheaper than what i'm used to from disney animation and I, it sort of felt like a direct-to-dvd level of budget and i know it was cheaper than a lot of the stuff that they'd done like i think specifically this movie was designed to be uh more cost effective than a lot of the the stuff at the time um and i, I actually just looking on its wikipedia page it says that it was the second of three disney animated features the other being uh, Mulan and Brother Bear that were produced at the Florida Animation Studio located at Disney's Hollywood Studios instead of, you know, in in like the Burbank Disney animation offices or whatever. So uh, I didn't even know that any movies at all were were like primarily made in the Florida studio. So that was that was interesting. I thought that was just like a basically like a setup for tourists to like, no, you, you know, drop in. And... You used to actually be able to like go on that tour and like look in at the the artist animating which is actually so strange now because you'd think like nowadays with you know everybody has an iphone and stuff like that they would be taking pictures of like what they're doing and like putting it online yeah yeah Yeah. Um, also should be said that when i did toy story 4 press it was in the old animation headquarters building that no longer houses animators and all the rooms are like you walk into like the various meeting rooms and they all have names uh, based on Lilo and Stitch and Brother Bear characters. It's very strange. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I don't know. I was just going to like throw this out there to the group. Like, do you guys have any love for Lilo, Lilo and Stitch or is this something that, that I just like missed out on? Is it something that maybe, uh, I don't know, like did I did I miss the boat <laughs> on it and that's why I just didn't really connect with it? Or what do you guys think? Lilo is pretty great. Stitch kind of sucked. That's my hot take. Really? I, I feel like yeah. Stitch is such a great character. The design by Chris Sanders. Uh, you can see, you know, his influence on, like, How to Train Your Dragon, Toothless, stuff like that. Um, I think, you know, you see him. He's all over the park. I, there isn't much of a story here. And I feel like that's probably to its weakness. I remember loving the the watercolor backgrounds. But I'm sure that probably looks kind of crappy nowadays, especially compared to you know all the CG animated movies we get. Um, I it, it also had that incredibly catchy Elvis remix 
that was everywhere at that time. Yeah, the music was fine. I don't know. I just I I came away going like, oh yeah, that's that was okay. Um, I just don't didn't really understand why there was such a huge love for it because um, it's it feels like one of those movies that people are like that they go crazy over um, in the Disney, uh, whatever uh, the Disney body of work that I just um, I don't know. I've always missed out on. So uh, I was curious. I, I wonder if like HT has like a big love for this movie. So it's it's sad that she's not. Oh, she's able prob- to join she's us probably today, in but... that age range. Yeah. It, it, I bet she heard you say "ugly watercolor backgrounds," Peter, and like her body shiver, not just running oh, towards you. No, no, like, I didn't like, say like, "ugly like, watercolor." Like, I said, "I." It follows. We're like H T start following you, trying to destroy you now, Peter. She'll never stop. No, it, it's beautiful watercolor backgrounds. I'm just saying, I don't think it probably, it probably, you you know, when you used to watch like the old uh, animated cartoons on TV, not like shorts that were made the for theatrical like mickey mouse and stuff like that but like the ones where like they would just have a background that didn't move it, it kind of feels like that like it feels old timey now lilo and stitch was also one of those movies that needed to be changed uh in the wake of 9 11 because the end sequence originally had the spaceship like tearing through a, a city um and then they changed it so that it was going through like a a more like I think it's mountainous or like rural like um, forestry jungle kind of area. Oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah, think... there's there's like a whole there, there's a few different articles and videos that show uh, what the sequence like what it was originally like compared to how they had to fix it. Hmm. Cool. And uh, you've also been watching Big Little Lies. Yeah, I finished the second season of Big Little Lies and just wanted again to sort of open this up to anybody else who may have. I've been watching along. Um, I found the second season overall to start out pretty promisingly and then just sort of uh, sputter to a close. I think the the courtroom stuff that happened near the end, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into details to avoid spoilers and stuff, but um, I just found it to be like ludicrous on its face. It just seemed it seemed shocking to me that David E. Kelly, who is the uh, creator of the show and and um he wrote, wrote all of the episodes of this season and sort of came up with the storyline along with leanne moriarty who wrote the original book that the first season was based on uh david e kelly is like one of those guys that created a lot of like really popular uh law related shows the courtroom dramas and stuff um you know in the the 90s and early 2000s and this courtroom scene is just I mean, it, I, I was I was in shock watching this. Like, I cannot believe that a show that has, you know, this level of um, acclaim and, and people, you know, uh, talent associated with it could end in this way. Um, I don't know. I, overall, I just felt like the second season did not justify the return. Like, it, it was originally just supposed to be a one and done one season thing. And even though Meryl Streep, you know, came came around for the second season that got a lot of people excited. I'm not even sure that her performance warranted a second season, but I, I wanted to throw this out there and see if I'm alone, if I'm on an island out here, if anybody else feels the same way. When I got home from Comic-Con, I only had time to watch one thing with my wife before, you know, work called for both of us. And we both chose BattleBots over the season finale of Big Little Lies, which I think says a lot about how good BattleBots is and how disappointing this season has ultimately become. Yeah, I'm curious to see what you think about it when you finally uh, check that out, because it, it, it sort of it wraps everything up in an interesting way or or I don't know about interesting, but it wraps everything up in a way. <laughs> and um, and I, I wonder what you think about that and, and whether it should come back for a third season, because I think there's like some rumors that it might. Um, I, for one, feel like that would be a disastrous decision. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I also think it should be added that um a slash contributor, Jessica Mason, who works as a lawyer in addition to writing, uh, she pitched me that this was the single most inaccurate courtroom scene she's ever seen in any single TV show or movie, and she's seen a lot of them. And we have an article about that on the site where she breaks down just how beyond the Hollywood norm this courtroom scene goes to step away from what is actually acceptable in any courtroom at any time whatsoever. So if you're interested, that's on the site right now. Nice. Okay, uh, let's move on to, I guess, what we've been eating. Uh, Jacob, uh, I mean, I I spent some time with you in San Diego, went to a bunch of places. Uh, What do you want to talk about on the podcast? 
Uh, yeah, I want to start with the our last day breakfast with you, me, and HT. With the Richard Walker's Pancake House, which we found by googling best breakfast in San Diego, and apparently everybody knows it's the best breakfast in San Diego because it was a forty-five minute wait or so. It was a big line out front, but the line did go reasonably quickly. Um, but depending on how long you think a breakfast wait should be, and when we sat down, I was really impressed with the food. It was just a really, really good pancakes. Uh, really, really good juice. You, you got like shit. pancakes with like bacon in them. I've never yeah, seen I've, that before. I've had pancake bacon, uh, bacon pancakes before, but these were exceptionally good bacon pancakes. I'm curious here. You and HC got their, their like massive baked apple pancake dish, which is like apparently their number one most famous uh, meal. How was that for you? Yeah, I guess it's kind of like a German pancake or something like that. Um, it tastes almost like a apple pie more than it does a pancake. It, it was fantastic. I've actually, I didn't know when you Googled this place, uh, but I've actually been here before when I went to San Diego the one time outside of Comic-Con with Kitra. And uh, I, this place is awesome. If you ever go to San Diego and want a cool breakfast place, I, I would highly recommend this place. Yeah, worth the wait. Like you see a line on front. I, I was not disappointed at the end of that long wait. Yeah. Um, what else did you want to talk about? Uh, it wouldn't be a trip to San Diego for me unless I go to La Puerta a few times. I ended up going three times <laughs> uh, this year. I don't know if La Puerta is famous or if it's like a tourist spot or if locals like it. I honestly don't know. All I know is that's a tequila bar and Tex-Mex restaurant uh, on the edge of the gas lamp district, about a 15-minute walk from the convention center. And they have really good food, uh, really strong chips and salsa, and most importantly, excellent margaritas including a margarita made with serrano peppers that is an excellent, really, really excellent and has a really good spice to it. And Peter, I convinced you to try one of their spicy margaritas when you were there. Yeah, I like margaritas. I have never tried a spicy margarita before, and I really love this thing. I think I got three of them by the end of the night. And uh, HT was there. We were all drinking. It was it was just a fun – what was this, Saturday night? Was this after all the, all the Marvel yeah, this, craziness? This is our post-Marvel um, – chill down i think we were we were all a little drunk by the end of the night i think yeah the the funny thing is like jacob wasn't drunk you could tell he was buzzed but by the time he got buzzed he started like regaling me and ht with all these like horrible movie hut takes (laughs) just like one after (laughs) another i don't even remember what they were but like me and ht were just like shaking our head every single time jacob you gotta tell us one of them (laughs) Well, one of them, the one I agree with, I think, most strongly, even when sober, is that Inside Lewin Davis is the best Coen Brothers movie. So, you know. Am I wrong? I'm not sure that, that, not sure that that's like a, a hot take or a bad take, but I just disagree <laughs> with it. <laughs> like, I think it's a great movie, but I don't, I don't think it's their best movie. Oh. Uh. <laughs> you're all, you'll you'll be in ten years. You'll all be singing its praises and talking about. Oh, I always thought it was the best. No, you didn't. Fuck you. <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm gonna interject here and say that Jacob is right. It is the best Coen Brothers movie. Yes. <laughs> Wait. Okay. So what was the uh, what was some of the other hot takes that you were telling us uh, during this? James Cameron's never made a better movie than the first Terminator. Th- that's insane. That's just insane. And he made no, a better it's... Terminator movie in Terminator no, 2. No, Terminator 1 is about twice as good as Terminator 2. And I love Terminator 2. <sighs> I don't know, Jacob. <laughs> I feel like we just need to have a podcast like once a month where it's just like Jacob's hot takes. A drunken <laughs> podcast sounds like a yeah. good idea. I think oh. Jacob actually pitched this to Angie when I, Angie was I pitched it, I, I pitched the drunk podcast to Angie years ago when I was still a writer and not an editor. And it was rejected at the time. But um, during this trip, we cooked up some podcast ideas, idea of maybe building a little network of, of show ideas, um, one of which we, H.E. and I already pitched, our Doctor Who Star Trek podcast, and one of which H.E. and I discussed additionally, which is the We Get Drunk and have and, and Shout Hot Takes at Each Other podcast. So if you want to hear the drunk movie podcast, <laughs> uh, let us know. You know, we might have to create a, like, a Patreon and see if people want that and do that as a special thing or something. Uh, I'm not sure if I want uh, our drunken selves out there to, to the masses. I don't know. We'll find out. Ben, what, what, uh, what is your thoughts on this? I mean, we'll have to take this off mic and have some serious discussions about this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what I've been eating. I uh, Before I went on the trip, I went to AMC. I was off my diet, and I tried that Spider-Man popcorn that Brad talked about a couple weeks ago on the water cooler. And uh, 
Brad, I think you were unable to to tell me what the flavors were of this no, popcorn. Well, there's because there, there's not a flavor. It's no, there just, is. It, it, one of them's caramel, and one of them's vanilla. Really? Yeah. Because the oh, that's weird. Because the person I asked at AMC said that there wasn't really a flavor; that it was just a general candy coating. Well, the person told, I asked told me caramel and vanilla, and it tasted like caramel and vanilla. Oh, fair enough. So well, I'm, I mean, I'd have to try it again with that in my mind to like to yeah. confirm that. But for, I mean, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was fine, right? It, it was it was okay. Um, yeah. The, the one thing, the weird thing that I didn't anticipate is that that color coating starts to get on your hands after a while. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of messy. Um, also, I wanted to uh, plug this new thing I found called G butter. And this is a nut butter of some kind. It comes in a jar. You can buy it on Amazon, although it's a lot cheaper if you find it on, like, if you do a Google search and find it. And uh, this G butter comes in all these different flavors. You can get, like, birthday cake G butter. You can get cookie, uh, chocolate chip cookie B butter, brownie uh, G butter. And um, it's uh, it's rather tasty. It's a, a, t- a very tasty snack that is low in carbs, high in protein. Uh, and you can do this thing with G butter where you can actually take a spoon of it, put it on a plate, put it in the microwave for like 30 seconds. And it basically turns it into like a cookie or a brownie. I mean, it's not as like as good as a normal cookie or brownie, but it's a very tasty, uh, warm desserty treat, uh, that I highly recommend. So that is G butter. Brad, what have you been eating? Actually, before we get to me, uh, I sent I had sent you your shirt from Star Wars Celebration a while back, and I also gave you a little bit of an extra thing. Did oh, you try them? I did. Yeah, you included some of uh, the Sour Patch Kids. Uh, it was Freeze. No, Pop? the Skittles. Oh no, the it Skittles. was Free Freeze Pop. Uh, yeah, Freeze Pop Skittles. Sorry, you were disappointed in them as I was. I was. They you couldn't even really taste much of a difference between that and normal Skittles. Yeah, exactly. They were they were just Skittles flavored, I think. Yeah, like, were they just different colors? Yeah, that's what it seems like. It seems like they kind of just made the colors a little bit more vibrant for summer and said they were freeze pops, but the I, I, I could not tell the difference between those flavors and the, the, the other flavors that were already released in other Skittles packs. I, I think I'm confusing this with when I was away at Comic-Con, Kitra got Sour Patch, Kittle, uh, Sour Patch Kids uh, Tropical flavor, and they're horrible. Oh, yeah, the- yeah, the, uh, those weren't very good either. <laughs> so, so what what have you been eating? Is there anything good to eat? Just one thing recently. Um, there's uh, mac and cheese Pringles, and apparently these were initially part of the. Um, there was a the fir- very first time Pringles did a special edition like Thanksgiving pack that they only gave out to certain people. Uh, mac and cheese was part of it, uh, but this is the first time they've actually released them, and they're exclusively available in Dollar General stores. So I found one and tried them out. And they don't really taste like mac and cheese, but they do taste like several different cheeses that would be part of a mac and cheese recipe, if that makes sense. Because I've always found that the cheese-flavored Pringles are almost a little too cheesy. Whatever cheesy seasoning and powder they use to put on the chips, uh, it it tastes too fake cheesy for me. Not that this tastes like real cheese, but the taste of the cheese on the mac and cheese Pringles reminded me of that, which it, of how it tastes when it's mixed in with mac and cheese, with with butter and uh, and the pasta and whatnot. So it's it doesn't taste exactly like you know what you would uh, um, anticipate mac and cheese would taste like, but it does taste like that uh, the cheese fl- flavor is better to me than the usual cheese Pringles. Hmm. Okay. Uh, lastly, let's talk about what you've been playing, Brad. Yeah, so a long, uh, not a long time ago, a little bit ago, we wrote up that Netflix is turning the video game Cuphead into an animated series, and I had always seen the action figures and merchandise tied to the game, but I'd never actually seen the gameplay, and I was the one who wrote about it for the site, and so I had looked up some gameplay videos to see what it was like, and I was very intrigued by the old school uh, classic animation style of it that's tied to cartoons of the, the 30s and 40s. And the the jazz soundtrack that also harkens back to that time period. So I decided to buy it and give it a shot because it was a it's also a run and gun game like old school arcade games like Contra and stuff. And I decided to give it a shot. And holy shit, this game is hard as hell. 
like I, I liked playing games like this when I was a kid, and I, I thought I was pretty good at them. But man, I am terrible at Cuphead, um, and it, it's a very difficult game <laughs> to, to play. I was getting extremely frustrated while I was playing it. Hmm. So where can you play Cuphead? Uh, it's available on Xbox and PC, and I think it's available on Nintendo Switch now. Okay, uh, that brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. You can find more of all of our work at SlashFilm.com. You can find this podcast published every day on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at Peter at SlashFilm.com. Please tell me if you'd like to hear that drunken podcast episode. <laughs> and uh, please rate and read this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, hey, Peter. Oh, no. <laughs> Peter, close your eyes. Peter, yeah. close your eyes. I'm not going to close my eyes. You, you don't know if I'm closing my eyes or if they're open, Jacob. I trust you. You're not a liar. I uh, No, but I, I printed this out, Jacob, so yeah, that I could... that's why I have to close your eyes. <laughs> Jacob, you're going to get me... You're going to make me, like, tattoo this in the, in the in, inside of my eye, uh, eyelids. If oh. I must, yes. What's the book called, Peter? <sighs> With my eyes closed... Yes. Oh, God. Uh, the Gargantuan Book of Insult Offense. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jay, Jacob, just tell us the jokes. Just tell us All the right, insults. Well, well, I'm opening up the Gargantuan Book of Insult, Offense, and Affrontery by Louis A. Safian. <laughs> To the losers section, because that's where we all are. Hey, Peter, the one thing that has kept you from making a fast buck is always a slow horse. Because uh, huh. you gamble. <laughs> I hope that that's part of the actual joke, because you gamble. <laughs> well, Brad, two business firms are fighting over your services. The loser gets you. Oof. <laughs> Uh, ben, he's a dependable person. You can always depend on him to do the wrong thing. <laughs> and Chris, he saved for years to buy an unbreakable, waterproof, shockproof watch. And then he lost it. The classic me. Wait, 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 wait. That last one, I, I don't understand it. I, he, I, he saved for years to buy an unbreakable, waterproof, shockproof watch. And he lost it. Say I, I wasted years for something and I immediately lost it. Is what you, you, so you should have bought a watch that w had like GPS. Is what he's saying. I guess. Yeah. You, Peter, you saved for years to buy an unbreakable waterproof <laughs> chocolate watch and lost it. You know, jokes are really funny when you have to say them three times in a row. You saved for years to buy an unbreakable <laughs> waterproof <laughs> chocolate watch and lost it. Oh, I get it now. All right, that one did it. <laughs>